hello. Hello. <laughs> Um, my name is Sarita Pokel, and I am the Alliance and Curriculum Director of Women's First Alliance. And um, I want to welcome everyone here to um, the World Weaver Salon Series. Um, it's a great, um, one of the things that we like to do. Okay, like, like uh, coronavirus. Oh, one of the um, things that we talk about at Women's Earth Alliance is um, turning um, turning crises into opportunities and, and trying to flip our mindset about how we look at things. And our World Weaver salons used to be quite local. We're, we're located in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we used to do house party kind of salons here. And because of COVID-19, we thought, well, what a great opportunity to weave our world together and have some, our international uh, uh, grassroots women leaders um, getting to tell their stories to a wider community. So we're all here together and we're here today to hear from Tasha Carissa, the um, amazing co-founder of, she's, she's up in my right hand corner, I don't know where she is for you all, <laughs> but she um, was one of the participants of, um, of the 2019 Indonesia Gra Women's Earth Alliance Grassroots Accelerator Program. And um, she has a very inspiring work, um, and she's going to um, tell us all about it tonight and the state of coral in Indonesia and all kinds of other things. But I think this is a great time. It's, it's so wonderful to have everyone here, and I'm going to pass um, the, floor, the Zoom over to Tasha. And um, thank you so much, Tasha, for being so generous with your time and sharing with us. All right, so thank you, Sarita, for opening and introduce me to all of the uh, participants, or should I call them our friends, uh, whether it's tonight in the part of America or other part of the world, and morning in part of Southeast Asia. And for people who don't know me yet, my name is Tasha. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Bayer Indonesia. So we're managing around about 13 restoration projects using Bayer technology in Indonesia. So, um, yeah. So uh, I will uh, I will do like a 25 minutes presentation um, with a little bit details on um, about the technology, and after that we can start with the question and answer. Correct, Sarita? Or I'm missing that's anything? Perfect. No, nope, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so now I'm start to share my presentation about um, Google Drive. I will start presenting. It's more about sharing, like um, sharing what I do usually in my daily work. So. Uh, I'm now in my home, but also in my office because I'm a mother. I have three kids and still breastfeeding, so I changed one of my room as an office. So um, tonight or this morning, uh, we'll, we will talk about growing resilient communities through restoration. And yeah, firstly, I would like to talk about color condition in Indonesia. Um, some of you are familiar with this because uh, you are the Indonesians and some of you maybe have different knowledge and not, not know yet about the condition in Indonesia. Okay, so, so um, yeah, coral reef in Indonesia is about two and, two and a half million hectares of coral reefs. That's like the, the, uh, the spread of the coral reefs, like 17 percent of the world total it's not that much but the amount of the species you know the type of even different species of coral reefs we have 569 which is 76 sorry uh 67 percent of the total which is biggest in the world so um even though we don't have that quantity but we have a lot of uh collection of species which is very rich on biodiversity 
and it's also not just coral but also a lot of fish that very different but although we have a very good amount of species in Indonesia unfortunately 30 percent of the corals are destroyed as you can see, and 40% um, of the beach are eroded. So you can see almost every place in the beach, in the island, uh, the coral is not there, the trees are falling down. So that's what's happening in Indonesia at the moment. Yeah. And actually, um, 100 billion of uh, Indonesian rupiah budget already spent on the restoration and conservation. And as you can see uh, in the pictures here, I put, you know, um, it's common when we see in the television or in the uh, internet news that even our president already said that we will um, transplant uh, 1 million of coral reefs, uh, our president Joko Widodo said. But unfortunately, from all of the, you know, the fancy, the millions of budgets, there are no public reports on the impact. What is happening after they planted? And whether they all, die, all died or how many are succeeded, we don't know. So that's what's happening. And now uh, I, I, I get this, um, this coral status on 2017 from our one from our uh, research, uh, what do you call it? The Coral Reef uh, Scientist uh, Board announced uh, the coral reef status uh, from, from 19, maybe the last in 1994 to 2016. So there are some red lines, yellow lines, and green lines, and blue lines. So. Uh, the blue lines, it means excellence. So you can see so colorful of corals everywhere and colorful fishes. And you know, starting in 1994, three, it's still low and, and its number is not going anywhere. It's just, you know, uh, up, up and down, but very slightly. And the good condition, we have uh, col uh, cor uh, corals, but also some a bit of sand and some a bit uh, dry coral. The amount is like 20 to up to 30 percent, so up and down. And the other criteria, which is enough, sorry, the good enough and bad, which is uh, yellow and red, it's getting worse because uh, sometimes it's uh, decreasing, but on starting 2015, it's uh, increasing sharply because of the mass splitting, the global warming. So. Um, as you can see, for the last maybe 20 years, uh, the coral reef condition is not getting better, even though there are already uh, budget spends, like millions of budget spends, and uh, it's uh, in the headlines almost uh, every Earth Day, every Coral Day. So the reality, the coral reef in Indonesia is not getting better. So um, we also would like to see what actually the cause of coral reef destruction in Indonesia. And we have two two types actually the cor the, the 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 cause of the coral reef destruction. One is the acute, uh, just like a disease, it's it's quick, it's fast, and um, pe when people see like it's very very shocking like when. You know the ship hit the coral reef in Rajo Ampat, and also when the fishermen are using bomb or damaging coral to get the the fish, um, and people or the media usually um, in, which, um, in a Zoom for for a very very large coverage. And actually, when the water is good enough, because it's just mechanical destruction, it will recover although it's very slowly. It depends on um, the growth rate of the corals and also um, the, the water condition of, of the ocean itself. So the more healthy the, the ocean, the more clean the ocean, the more the, the coral can recover. So 
Um, and the next cause is a chronic. Chronic is like disease. It's slowly, sometimes we don't even realize, but it's also um, dangerous. So um, you can see this is actually what happens in our everyday life. We, we, we live in a house uh, that um, having a septic system, uh, also uh, create nutrients and pathogens that is bad for coral. There is a uh, government building cities and also in the forest, you know, there is Sumarni in Kalimantan. When people cutting down the forest, it will also um, make the sand, so not, not the sand, make the um, sand or even the soil move from, from the forest through the river and the river to the ocean. That create also sedimentation that will cover uh, the coral reef. Actually, whatever happens here, who makes the water dirty, smelly, uh, we don't like it. And also the coral doesn't like it. So that's what happened. Uh, as you can see, the more uh, there is development, unfortunately, the, the, the river and also the ocean is not getting cleaner. So sometimes people just say that, well, it's the consequence of development, unfortunately. If we believe that, then, um, where there's people, then the coral could not grow. So uh, that is very sad the situation. Then, um, okay. So what is the refrigeration and challenges in Indonesia? Okay. So uh, nowadays, actually, uh, because of the media also, people sometimes mix uh, the terms restoration and also transplantation. When we say restoration, People usually just think of the technical, technical things like what is the method for restoration? What is the best way to grow the corals? Where actually, when we when people talk about that, the technical thing is actually transplantation. Transplantation is like when you grow in a tree, you cut one of the branch and put it in the ground, and hopefully it can grow. So it's just actually a technical way to grow the coral. And it depends on the purpose. Transplantation can be used for aquarium supply. You can, you can grow corals on, a, on a very the same format, the same size, and you can order what kind of spatial do you want. And after that, you can treat more to enhance the color and then ship to the, um, you know, the supplier for the aquarium. And the second purpose is we can do transplantation for education or tourism, which is means the more people involved, the more people aware will be good. But that doesn't mean when people, um, more people join, it doesn't mean that more, color, more coral will also grow. So, so there will be different uh, purpose. And the last thing is we transplant coral for restoration. In the end, what we, what we aim is actually the change on the biodiversity. We want to see how coral will cover um, uh, the bottom of the floor and how many fishes will be swimming around and what other animals that will come to the uh, coral reef that we would like to see with transplantation for restoration. So once again, um, because we don't talk this much sometimes when we say restoration what people think is just transplantation so that's um, one thing that we should separate next okay uh, because coral is very animal that uh, grow very slow uh, roughly about one we can we can say one centimeter per year but other species can also grow up like five or ten centimeters per year but um, at the same time, we can say that they're very slow. That's why uh, restoring coral is somewhere between five years and also hundreds of years. So when we want to restore an ecosystem, we really, really need a lot of human resources to do the gardening. Like in this picture, uh, uh, some of my staff is attaching corals. That's the starting of the project and the below picture is uh, my other stuff is collecting uh, the pest or akanda uh, thorn is like the animals eat corals and it can eat in one night the
crown of thorn, the sea star, can eat one meter square of coral reefs in one night. And if we don't take it out very cautious, the eggs will spread out and we create in one single species, we'll create another million of these animals. So uh, these activities need um, people, the human resources to do the gardening. And that's why we need to get them salary because it's a full-time job sometimes. But um, we, we also need um, respect from these guys. So, and the reality when we say restoration, uh, people who live in coastal and remote islands actually are closest to coral reef, but sometimes of, often least developed. So they have uh, difficulties of get, uh, get um, income, education, health access. So this is the challenges when we want to restore coral reef and on the very long time, like five years to hundreds of years, but at the same time, these people need also uh, economy, need, need uh, infrastructure, need, need education, with, just like us. They, they also people like us who need every day to make things better. So the other thing is uh, our government of Indonesia already um, create the marine spatial planning. So uh, in the in the first picture, you see, you know, uh, like a slices of the uh, land and the ocean. Um, you can see in that picture, uh, so many activities actually happening in one small square of um, part of the beach or ocean. So people can fish, people can uh, navigate their boats, they can dive in, they can also uh, get fish. So uh, because of these things and never actually uh, set a regulation before people fighting each other because there is no clear boundaries where people can actually uh, get fish, where people can actually dive in. And because uh, all of this time people just fighting and sometimes the richest are the winner. Uh, so go our government create this marine spatial planning and it's already there in 21 province, I think. Uh, and unfortunately, Bali is not there yet. Bali already uh, created a draft of regulation, but it's not been um, launched by our governor. So it means until the regulation is launched or officially launched, people still fighting for their territory. The, um, the fishermen also will face to face with the uh, landlord or, or investor who wants to have their guests, um, you know, relaxing at the beach, but they don't want to see the fishermen catching the fish in their area. So that kind of fighting is happening every day in Indonesia. Okay. Um, so what we do to address the problem, what the buyer Indonesia do, so we have four pillars here. We have science, of course, and then conservation, uh, we restore our corals. And we have also economic catalyzation because uh, I previously said the people who live in the coastal and also in the remote islands are least developed. That's why we make a program through uh, tourism. So we partner with the uh, with the local community groups, we partner with the local uh, homestay owners, we partner with um, you know restaurants to create a tourism package that will uh, benefit everybody uh, through this activity. So it means when people um, join our program, they can help uh, both the environment also with uh, the local community, which unfortunately, because of the COVID-19, the tourism sectors are closed everywhere so that will also affecting our program uh, in Bali and also in other area but we're still figuring out how actually we can still uh, taking care of the coral well in the COVID-19 situation and the fourth part of our pillars is advocacy so we don't we don't just work in the grassroots but we also discuss in the high level 
we talk with the um, local government, we talk with the national government, and we talk also at the United Nations. So in this picture, one of my team, uh, Ricky, is um, discussing with other uh, country members in United Nations uh, in Bangkok, I think, about uh, the strategy of the COVID restoration uh, with community. So these four pillars, the science, conservation, and uh, economic, advocacy we hope that uh, first it will sustain create sustainable local economic uh, so sustainable local economic growth and it will engage empowered communities and create will create a cycle to create a healthy coral reef and ensure protected lines because as um, I said previously it will create a long time to recover the core if it can take five to hundred of years so we need to work in both sides in the uh, environment and also in the communities because with these two combinations uh, the project the restoration project will grow together in a long time right so um, we have four programs here we have viral garden um, scholar reef and also bio, sorry Bear Garden Scholarship, Bear Experience, and Show Protection. That's our four main programs, and I will explain one by one. Right, so Bear Garden is basically how we restore coral reef uh, through two ways. We train local community groups uh, so they can restore coral reefs, and also we educate through volunteer and internship program, and I see that one of our volunteers already here so this is uh, what our volunteers will experience they will learn directly uh, how to actually restore calories and i will explain more about the technology i will stop it for a moment because i will back with yeah i will back with this Yeah. Sarita, can you still hear my voice? Can you still see me, Sarita? Yes, we can hear your voice and we can see you. And also, um, I would recommend for everyone that you put it on speaker view for this instead of gallery view. I don't know which you have your setting, but um, you'll have um, view. Okay, so everybody, uh, if you like to see it more clearly, you can put the speaker view instead of gallery view on the it depends because i'm using tablet i see it on my i see it on my tablet it's left side oh it's not that clear it's better on this way sorry yeah so uh is it clear or not yeah so here I have our miniature. Oh, yeah. Here I have miniature of bio rock. So, as you can see here, right. This is uh in the middle is the steel cut from our bio rock structure. It's just regular steel. And the white, the white thing is actually a limestone that grow on the steel that we use for, with the coral reef. So bio-rock technology is actually just like a, uh, what do you call it? Like uh, um, low electricity in the water, so, so like electrolysis. When you put two, two metals, one is the I, the steels, the regular steel like this, and the other when we call it, oops, sorry, way it's not showing. Okay, that's the other metal. Let's call anode. So.
Why is he not swearing? Yeah, this is this is the meta, the second meta. Oops. What happened? This is the second method, and that one, the first method, will create things like this. Now you can see it here. So those two methods will be connected by by cables. See by cables, and it will. We have also a system. Uh, on the ground, it will convert the electricity from the high voltage to a low voltage and we transfer to a very, very safe electrolysis. So, uh, the materials that I'm showing here, so this is also the metal. The materials is actually the same with corals, it's calcium carbonate. So we, instead of using uh, artificial materials, we actually grow the materials. We just actually extract the minerals from the ocean and attach the minerals to the metals using this low voltage electrolysis. So it's completely the same materials. And because, because of the corals uh, attached to the structure like this, when it happens, the, um, the corals who usually struggle to grow this kind of limestone and using so much energy, this condition already saved uh, so much energy so they can um, use their energy to grow instead of uh, creating a pH, like uh, balancing their acidity to create a condition where they can extract the calcium to grow. So it's mimicking how actually corals grow in the natural process. Because it's similar, then it will make corals save so much energy and they grow better, healthier, and faster. So now I'm back to my presentation. Uh, Tasha. Yeah? You have a couple questions. Um, really? Do you want to wait till the end, or do you want? Well, it it's up up to you, Sarita. Which one do you think is better? Um, I think maybe um, maybe um, uh, Harul Anwar's question is he's because it directly relates to the hardware. He said one of the issues here for BioRock method is security. That some fishermen would take the cables and batteries and the solar panel. Is there a same oh. issue there, or how do you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly the same. That's why before actually we install the system, we should work with the communities first. We should gain their respect, their trust. We, we engage them first before actually we install, like, you know, like we, we make, this is a very, you know, very alien thing. They don't know what it is and they just see this very expensive thing. But before it happens, we should work our engagement program first. Um, we we have we have uh, formulated um, an engagement program, but we haven't started. We call it um, in Bahasa Indonesia. We call it um, uh, laut sehat uh, we, because we in Pemutran we call it laut sehat Pemutran hebat. It's like in English is healthy ocean makes um, great village or whatever the names of the village. So we we engage. We create engagement first with the community. We identify the stakeholders. So we do the whole, our homework first before we actually in, introduce the technology. Does it answer the question? Okay. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Uh, because here we got very wide sea, a wide oceans, and then it's open oceans. Some people could come with two hours just for fishing, which means if we build this in the middle of the oceans, which means it's far from the, what is it, 
uh, navy patrol area, it's gonna be very difficult. And yeah, if, <laughs> it's very difficult. <laughs> Even though some fishermen village support us, other fishermen village which have two hours, uh, what is it? Both time will make engage with this, and maybe is there some another village which not engaged uh, already engaged with us it's very, really difficult to what is it to catch them and guarantee all of them support us and maybe i would like to wait how could you engage some many fillets so it, they could uh, become what is it they could become guard of us to our bio rock system maybe isn't it yeah yeah, that, that will, I will explain on our next program. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm because, waiting for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, so I can continue, I think, back to the presentation. I can explain more about that. Yeah, and Ashley has, right, some, questions too. Ashley has some questions too, but I think we should wait because you might cover them and then we can ask them later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so back to the... Okay, we got two. Okay, we talk about uh, Bayer Garden, and now this is the question of Cairo just asked. So we have another program called Colorif. And it will be launched actually just this year. And this program is uh, inspired from my discussion through uh, Women's Health Alliance participants, also our mentor in uh, this accelerator program. So I noticed that people have questions. People like uh, Cairo have similar questions. How then actually we engage the community? So this program, Scholarly, uh, will be there to actually provide the answer. So before we start this store, the color reef, we should actually, um, uh, what do you call, have a person, a uh, local person, maybe like Kairu or other person, um, and already have passion to restore color reef, but don't know how to do it. So um, we we have the programs called color reef. One is to create, uh, increase the competency of the person who would like to be the future color protector. We have, a, we'll, we have an online course um, that will increase the uh, capacity on the technical things like the monitoring color reef, but also how to, how to actually um, learn about community. You know, we actually have understand the community on the number, on the quantity basis and the quality number quality basis, who is the leader, who is um, the strategic person to be addressed to talk about color reef, uh, will, be, um, will be teach or uh, to our future coral protectors. And um, also the, the these youth will also equip with how to communicate to others so they can confidently talk, talk to other person, maybe, uh, create a program with the local government and also talk to their peers about their, their knowledge. So with the, the data they just gathered with our methodology, because we train them online, uh, then they will have um, a data with a gender base. It means even though um, most of the leaders are male, we also consider the female uh, person also youth youth generation, so we have the uh, representation of each stakeholders. From the information gathered during this, uh, what do you call, uh, research, research with the scholarly program, then people like Kairul and other youth leaders will understand how actually uh, create a local uh, engagement program because all, all area will be different. We need to understand it first. To, through this program or any other socio-economic anthropology um, tools to really understand about the community and, and how actually make them engage with our program. 
So that um, one of our program that will be launched um, later this month. Um, yeah, and next program is prior experience. This will answer the question about um, how actually we can give uh, economic benefits to local community that we create partnerships with uh, with uh, travel agent, tour agent, with also local local divers, local um, what do you call the homestay. So we create a program with all of them to make it a better uh, benefit for all of us. So we have two program here. It's called Bioc Introduction. So everybody is welcome to learn about Bioc technology. We have a demonstration with our uh, manager there, Komang, uh, in our Bioc Center in Kamuteran. And our team also available to guide the tourists and give a story explanation about the community-based restoration program. And all the profits will be uh, distributed to uh, restore the coral reef and also uh, feed all the local community. So the last program we have is shore protection because um, as you can see, 40% of the shore are uh, in danger or trees are falling down, you can see that. So what we use bio rock is not just also for coral, but also for shore, we make a bio rock. But um, it can um, help like, in the second picture, you see that uh, it, it transforms the eroded beach to a uh, uh, new sand beach. We grow, we grow back the sand within months. So we, we use, we create bio rock uh, with uh, in special design. So actually, uh, can can break the strength of the wave and also hold the sand so it not grow and so it not run away anywhere. So it stays there, and uh, from these two, uh, sorry, we have bio garden and also shore protection. So basically, bio rock is just technology. So I just want to make it straight because sometimes people confuse bio rock with the thing, the thing that's shaped like um, statue. But actually, no, uh, bio rock is just technology. So we can use whatever we want. Uh, we can use a, as a wave breaker. We can use to restore coral. We can use for um, grow the materials for architecture, for anything. So it's just technology. It depends what is the purpose. And so now it's your turn. What you can do to support the colorist? Because so many restoration already happening to help with um, uh, restoration that's still in a good water condition. Coral um, regenerate, which is uh, whatever things that will pollute the water. What you can do is, um, you if you gardening, use fertilizer sparingly. Uh, it's a very simple thing. Pick up your pets and also um, do not dump paint. Actually, all of these means that please help us to keep keep the water clean from. Whatever you do in the ground, keep it on the ground uh, as long as possible. Don't um, don't throw it away in the ocean. Because people, when talk about plastic, because you can see plastic, it's everywhere, but you cannot see. Sometimes you cannot see these things, these um, chemicals, these uh, sediments. You cannot see things, but this is more dangerous for the corals than the plastic itself. And the last thing is, if you want to do more, you can uh, adopt a coral or garden with us. You can volunteer, you can be our partner. And soon, uh, you can join our online class. We're still on the preparation to do that. And if you want to donate, also we'll be welcome. You can just go to our website. that still you can just write me an email and after this I think Sarita can help me with the question and answer and also I'm an open book I'm a mother of three um, I'm working from home uh, in Indonesia with COVID-19 situation so any any question will be welcome it's not just limited to coral restoration so yeah let's talk soon
Awesome. Thank you so much, Tasha. So Ashley, had, Ashley had um, two questions. And so um, Ashley, how would you feel about just, um, you wrote, you, you wrote them out so nicely, but maybe you just want to ask them, <laughs> um, like unmute yourself and just Oh, okay. She can't speak to audio, so I can go. Oh, that's read. right. She can't. Okay. So here, the first one was, where does Indonesia get the funds that they use toward coral conservation? Is it mostly from the revenue streams in the country or is it from outside conservation groups, like big green groups, or where does the funding usually come from? Yeah, I think it will be mixed. It will be mixed between uh, in, in, what do you call it? in in income stream revenue i mean it we have revenue like from from the country like we have the companies that own sorry that own company like the oil and gas and the big companies usually have the csr program corporate social responsibility and we also have fund from um small companies from uh, other country and we have also personal donor but mostly from those the big billion the big budget thing is coming from um what do you call it? um if it if it contains uh our government program usually it can come from the where there is a world bank budget so it's mean like a government to government uh, cooperation but it can also through the uh loan again and also from the uh what you call it, again from the csr from each company so i think the biggest portion from come from the csr company whether it's from for the groups or for the uh, big events just like i just mentioned does you answer the question yeah, um, and then she also wanted to know that when you, you have your four pillars, can you expand on the epistemology? So like the values, your values as an organization, for example, um, considering the context of the coastal areas, the coastal fisher, fisher people um, may identify as indigenous and they have deep rooted word world values and knowledge systems within their culture and connection with the sea. These perspectives are often absent from science literature and are dismissed or can be distorted by outside researchers or visiting professionals who are from outside the fisher communities. So does your team incorporate ways for fisher people to contribute to the restoration and the research? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, actually when uh not just by indonesia i i i think all of the coral reef project in indonesia always not always but most of the time considered considered about um the local communities that's why on the scholarly scholarly program that i just mentioned we have uh two types of research before we we go deeper to install the project we we investigate from the environment side and we investigate from the social economic side that includes the indigenous person that includes how how can they uh, engage in this program but uh, the thing is when when the government do this kind of research sometimes it's just research it's not it's not communicated communicated effectively to make other people or other media understand more about it so sometimes when when we come so the execution part of the project, we talk just about the coral reef itself. So sometimes we forgot about the, the community. And um, what was that again? Uh, so my team does, yeah, my team does incorporate ways for the fisher people. And once again, all, all area will be different. That's why all, every, every, Every area, every location, will need to, to do this uh, investigation first before they can plan what kind of restoration will be due in their area. 
cool. And thank you. And you have um, a question from Hannah Mendez about COVID-19 and your response, your ability to respond now as an organization. Do you have plans um, to combat the negative effects of the tourism industry shutting down? Um, to continue and support the local economies, do you have do you have you been had time to create? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Honestly, uh, Indonesia is the second wave on the COVID nineteen, so we little bit away back way. Like we just started the the and uh, the the national social distancing like three weeks ago, so. Uh, uh, our organization still also still surviving uh, how to because our way of work also changed from the 100 maybe 75 percent field now changed to the digital things but yes our team is still there uh, taking care of the chorus but on the uh, helping with the local community that's another thing because uh, it's not just the local community itself in the in the uh, what you call in the coastal areas. I mean, all of the community also uh, in a very tough situation at the moment. But we still we still figuring it out how we can do this because uh, Indonesia is uh, very heavily uh, relying on the tourism sectors, and our government, I think, uh, also uh, trying to figure out what is the best way to help people working in the industry in the tourism. But what we can do, I think, at the moment is um, not just uh, because luckily uh, people who actually live close by in the ocean, they are nearby uh, on the fish. So I think for the meals on the on the meal, it's not that difficult like in the city where they relying people they live for their food. But uh, in the ocean, people still can get the fish, uh, and I think it's more easier now because uh, everybody's uh, closing down and uh, they can get more fish. I think, but I don't have the data first. It's just uh, what I'm what I'm thinking at the moment. Sarita. Yeah, thanks. Um, you have an, one last question from Karul. Karul, I'm wondering if you want to just ask your question, Natasha, about the non-tourism areas. Do you want to just ask her yourself, or I can read your question to you? Where I don't, I don't yes. see the Cairo. Yes. It's because. <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> Sorry. <laughs> while while actually working, so during the <laughs> webinar while working. Okay, thank you, Jessa. So, indeed, we will not more extensive social and anthropological approaching maybe for the engagement the uh, community, but. For the area that already uh, tourism have the uh, become their uh, uh, what is it uh, have the the tourism have the contribution to community they will be more they will more easily understand the bio rock project maybe but for the mm, for the area that still depends on traditional fishing and it's kind of like alien thing for this bio rock it might be more challenging. I just wondering, is there any, what is it, project or engagement that you could share to us for the area that is, is uh, the area is not contributing and it's not impacted by tourism. So uh, just like they are just doing the traditional fishing and then how long you take the engagement process from them from the zero is i mean to to make they believe this program is work for them they, they may believe it will give the impact uh, the good impact for their fishing and anything thank you yes very good question title because i think it's almost everybody's question when they want to apply the project so um again uh Bio rock is the technology, and the project will be depend will be varied from one to each another. So um, once again, it, it depends on how you investigate on the you know on the research phase before you actually do anything. So once once you understand it, then usually you will identify how then you can. Uh, Make the project sustainable. Like instance, if we don't do, we don't have the tourism sector, 
maybe we can collaborate with the fishery sector. It means we can uh, use bio rock uh, instead of the fishermen, you know, uh, going miles, miles away to get a fish, but we grow the corals to attract fish or they can use bio rock to have the um, mariculture without need to feed them. So it means, uh, you know, it's like, it's like an organic uh, farming. It's like organic farming. You can harvest the fish, uh, but then the next question is how can you market the fish? So again, you need to identify who, who are the person, who are the stakeholders who can uh, collaborate together. So um, I would like to highlight before you actually uh, make a plan of restoration, you should have a plan for your sustainability first whether it's tourism, whether it's fisheries, or whether it's, um, you, you can build your online donation fundraising, uh, it doesn't matter. So again, it, it depends on the result of your homework on investigating what are the possibilities. But uh, because of the ocean is uh, directly connected to tourism and also to fisheries, I think those two uh, can be um, develop or investigate further compared to other things. That's my temporary question, but I would happily to answer more questions if you have, uh, maybe through email or anything. Yeah, I added, um, I added Tasha's email to the chat box. Um, oh, I think I added it by accident to just to Karul. So I will <laughs> add it to everybody. Okay, you have a couple more questions here. Um, so um, from Claudia, um, she asked, Claudia, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to just ask it for you? Let's see. Um, what are, so I, I was just what, wondering um, what, if any, uh, current laws are you working with with the government to make sure that um, like the big ships don't come near the coral reef, right? So to keep uh, people from destroying it for when they're when they come near it. Anything that you guys are working on? Uh, could you explain more about who, who is not allowing to come near? I'm, uh, she's asking about the big ships when the when you talked about oh. why the coral is destroyed. Um, yeah. and you you mentioned that you guys do add that BioRock does advocacy, and she's just wondering, like, are there any laws <laughs> that you're working on or lobbying that you're working on to change the rules around the ships and the coral? Yeah. Yes, thank so you. So I think, yeah, so when when that thing happened, I think it's in 2017 when the, uh, there's a big ship uh, hitting the, our precious coral reef in Raja Ampat, and at that time, I was invited by our of the leading NGOs on uh, gathered in Jakarta at that time and we are giving advice to our government what to do and at that time I was uh, giving advice about how to restore it, how long it, it will take and how much it will cost like roughly because I could not calculate because I could not come because it was a uh, crime scene at that time um, so I just predicted um, um, how to do that then after all of the NGO leaders uh, giving, their, giving their advice to the government then government processing the lawsuit to the what do you call the, the people who who hit the coral and what I heard I think the the law action is not smooth so um, because I'm not in advanced person of the Low thing, so I just heard the update that it's not that going smooth. So we didn't win the case. Uh, our government didn't win the case. But uh, after that, then we also invited to make a, a review of the regulation on the navigation. So we make a revision. Of, we give advice to government how to. Uh, make a change on the regulation of navigation so it's not happening again. But I think we just have another case last year or 
if it happening, I think the, the ship is hitting hitting the coral reef. So uh, we haven't we haven't back there to the government yet to talk about it to review the result. Does it answer the question? Yeah, um, and then we have one last question. We're a little bit over time, but I think it's a perfect question to end on. This is from Hannah. And um, so um, as, you, as you might know, um, Tasha is connected to Women's Earth Alliance because of an accelerator program that Women's Earth Alliance um, puts on in Indonesia and around the world um, for women, grass, grassroots women environmental leaders. Um, so this is a perfect question to end on. Um, so Hannah says, thank you. Another question, what have you found in terms of women's roles in environmental protection projects? Do you feel it is mostly male dominated? Does this differ depending on the regions? Is it more female directed in Bali than other regions in Indonesia? No, actually, it's still male dominated almost everywhere in the world. Uh, I'm sure Sarita love because she totally understand the challenges, uh, the reason why Women Women's Earth Alliance decided to help the women leaders to do this because we women leaders have challenges when we because when we talk about uh, what we can do, uh, sometimes we 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 people see uh, us as a woman first instead uh, of what the material we are going to say. Um, remember when I said about the, uh, advising the government about the, the ship that was hitting the coral reef? At that time, uh, I was there, but all of the leaders, NGO leaders are all male and much, much more senior about me. And when they, um, you know, have a cancel conversation, they feel just smoking and uh, I, I could not mix there. So. That, that is the, the challenges that's on the higher level and uh, on the grassroots um, when I started the project in Ambon and I was there you know start from when I was pregnant with my second child and also back there still breastfeeding and and you know the question they are asking is just why are you here why you're not making coffee for your husband so so that kind of thing is, is happening so um, uh, that's that makes me to realize that sometimes even though I, I really want to do uh, in the field as much as I want, but sometimes it's not the best strategy I found. So I need to re rethink my strategy, how actually I can achieve my goal. Uh, so I need to revise my way to achieve that goal. Thanks to Women's Health Alliance. Great. So thank you so much, Tasha, for sharing um, about your work and about coral and um, and coral, the landscape of coral and the destruction and restoration of coral in Indonesia. And um, I just wanted to close the call with a few uh, little announcements. Um, I put a link to our Indonesia Grassroots Accelerator for 2020. The application and nomination process is now open and it closes April 20th. So last year we had 22 women from 17 regions in Indonesia. This is an uh, multi uh, uh, intersectional work. So Tasha is doing coral restoration. We had women con conserving mangroves and um, farming octopus and farming um, re regenerative agriculture and cacao and uh, women from all over Indonesia, a few that are on this call. Um, and so we um, invite any of you to pass that link along to other women who could use a little bit of support and camaraderie around being a woman in Indonesia and leading in environmental grassroots issues. And um, we will also be opening our US Accelerator um, next month in May 4th, I think the application is open. Um, and so we have that opportunity as well. Um, and the other thing is we will keep having these world weaver calls and we have another one in next week with a woman from the US Accelerator Program who is an indigenous woman from the East Coast of the United States um, who has an incredible seed saving project um, linked to the creation story of her people. And she's very inspiring, our friend Beth Roach. So that will be, um, we will send anyone that was on this call that invitation as well. 
So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for hanging on a little later um, than 8 p.m. And we're really, really happy um, that we could just share this, this incredible work and Tasha's work with the world. So thank you, Tasha. And this is recorded. Thank you. This was recorded and we'll send everybody a link of the recording um, uh, probably tomorrow or the next day. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. Have a great day or night or wherever you are in the world and um, be well.